Good morning, everyone. It is good to see you this day. We're grateful for every person who is here this morning. And as was mentioned, we do have some visitors, and we're sure thankful that you're with us. We hope that you'll come back and be with us as often as you can. Anytime you'd like to come and study with us, worship with us, we'd be delighted to have you here. If you are visiting this morning as someone from the community, or at least as someone who is not a member of a Church of Christ, this might be a particularly appropriate time for you to have visited with us. I say that because it is generally true that people who visit a Church of Christ, one of the first things that they notice is that whenever we sing, we don't have a piano or an organ or any kind of instrumental music that accompanies that singing. That is true of us, and we're going to talk about why that is today a little bit. So it might be something that would be very interesting to you to know just why that is our practice I really selected the lesson this morning to kind of follow what we talked about in our Bible class this morning. In our Bible class, we talked a little bit about the Bible itself and and how we should approach the Bible in terms of understanding the things that it is intended to teach us. We talked about a, a hermeneutic, which is just a fancy word for saying a way of understanding what the Bible says. To sort of start things off this morning, some time ago... I. I read an article about a book that had been written uh, by a man named John Price. Uh, the title of the book was Old Light on New Worship. Now, Mr. Price is a graduate of Trinity Ministerial Academy in Montville, New Jersey, and at the time of the writing of his book, he was the pastor of Grace Baptist Church in Rochester, New York. His intention in writing the book was to investigate whether or not the scriptures authorize the use of mechanical instruments of music in worship. In the preface of his book, he says this about that. He says, I have come to this subject with the conviction that the scripture alone should be our guide in all matters of faith and practice. I believe there is such a thing as pure worship, and that, that is according to the will of God. And it should be our goal to have such worship in the church. Our worship should be governed not by our own personal desires or preferences, nor by the culture or society in which we live, but by the word of God alone. And I think that's quite right. We talk from time to time about how easy it is for people to let their feelings be their guide in terms of what they think they should do to be pleasing to God, how they should worship God, what, what other things God would have them to do. And although sometimes that makes us feel like we are worshiping appropriately or feel like we're glorifying and honoring God, that doesn't necessarily make it so. Now, now there have been churches who have kind of bought into this idea uh, and some churches have gone so far even as to survey a community to find out what the community thinks they would like to see in a church. And when they get those results, then they tailor their worship services and their ministry to order to, in order to meet the community's felt needs. And, and what that has resulted in is lots of things that that we really can't find mentioned in Scripture, things like church-sponsored sporting events and you know, uh, financial workshops and aerobic classes and, and, and all kinds of things like that. Uh, the society was shaping what the church should be. But, but notice what Mr. Price says here. This is a Baptist minister who says worship should not be governed by personal desires or preferences. He's quite right about that. Nor by the culture or society in which we live, but by the word of God alone. Some familiar passages here. All scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be adequate, equipped for every good work. If there's something good that God wants men to do, the scriptures equip him to do that. We, we understand what we need to do, what we need to be, by reading the word that God has given to us, trying to understand it as best as we can, and then putting it into practice in our lives. So with that resolution, with that resolution, Mr. Price set out to examine what the Bible teaches about the use of musical instruments in the worship of the church. Now here's what he concluded. He said, instruments of music were used in the worship of the Old Testament, not as human judgments about what would make worship more attractive, 
but by divine commandment with divine authority. Well, he's right about that too. In Numbers 10, in verse 10, for example, we can read these words. Also, in the days of your gladness and in your appointed feasts and on the first days of your months, you shall blow the trumpets over your burnt offerings and over the sacrifices of your peace offerings. Here's, a, here's, here's clear scripture that talks about the use of instruments in the worship of God. In Psalm 150, the 150th Psalm in verses 3 through 5, we find these words. Praise Him with trumpet sound. Praise Him with harp and lyre. Praise Him with timbrel and dancing. Praise Him with stringed instruments and pipe. Praise Him with loud cymbals. Praise Him with resounding cymbals. And if I could get you to open your Bibles, please, to 2 Chronicles chapter 29. Let's read some verses in 2 Chronicles chapter 29. We'll read verses 25 through 27. 2 Chronicles 29, starting in verse 25. He then stationed the Levites in the house of the Lord with cymbals, with harps, and with lyres, according to the command of David and of Gad the king's seer and of Nathan the prophet. For the command was from the Lord through his prophets. The Levites stood with the musical instruments of David and the priests with the trumpets. Then Hezekiah gave the order to offer the burnt offering on the altar. When the burnt offering began, the song to the Lord also began with the trumpets accompanied by the instruments of David, king of Israel. It is absolutely clear that God commanded the use of instruments as elements of praise under the old law. But Mr. Price correctly states that the Old Testament pattern for worship was not the same as the pattern for worship used in the New Testament in many respects. In New Testament worship, there's no temple, there was no Levitical priesthood, there's no animal sacrifices, and so forth. And Mr. Price also observes, and this is, this is really, really important, that the Old Testament pattern of worship in all of these kinds of outward ceremonies and rituals was abolished when the New Testament was established. And I will say to you that Mr. Price was quite right about that too. In Colossians chapter 2, in Colossians chapter 2, verses 13 through 17, let's read those verses. Colossians chapter 2, starting in verse 13. Paul writes these words. He says, When you were dead in your transgressions and the uncircumcision of your flesh, He made you alive together with Him, having forgiven us all our transgressions, having canceled out the certificate of debt consisting of decrees against us, which was hostile to us, and He has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. When he had disarmed the rulers and authorities, he made a public display of them, having triumphed over them through him. Therefore, no one is to act as your judge in regard to food or drink or in respect to a festival or a new moon or a Sabbath day, things which are a mere shadow of what is to come, but the substance belongs to Christ. We also have these words from Galatians chapter 4. As Paul writes to the churches of Galatia, he says in verses 10 and 11, he says, You observe days and months and seasons and years. I fear for you that perhaps I've labored over you in vain. Observing Sabbath days and feast days and monthly feasts and things like these were part of Old Testament worship. They were not a part of the worship of Christians. And the churches of Galatia were having a little bit of a struggle with this this idea of going back to the old way of doing things. And Paul says, I'm afraid I've taught you for nothing. I'm afraid I've spent time teaching you and it's, it's not it's not come to fruition the way that it should have. And, and, and Mr. Price says this. He says, we must look to Christ and his apostles alone for the worship of the church. And then he concludes this way. With no command, example or any indication whatsoever from the Lord Jesus that he desires musical instruments in his church, we have no warrant for their use. This morning in our Bible class, we talked about statements and commands, examples, and necessary inferences. Notice the reasoning that he's using here. No command, no example, no indication. He's understanding the scriptures the same way that we should understand any kind of communication. And he's quite right again. 
we have no warrant for their use. And he even anticipates an objection to this argument, which uh, we may have sometimes heard. He, he says, you know, some may say that all of this is only an argument from silence. But silence is the regulative principle of worship. Where God is silent, we do not add to his worship. His silence means that he has given no command and we have no authority to act. His silence on musical instruments means we have no authority to bring them into the worship of the church. And, and, and what, what he is saying is that the church belongs to God. The church belongs to the Lord Jesus Christ. It is Jesus who died for the church. It is, it is Jesus who said he would build the church. It is Jesus who Paul tells the Ephesian elders in Acts 20 and verse 28 that he purchased the church with his own blood. The church belongs to him. He is the one, he is the only one who can say to us, this is what the church should be. And we have no right to act without some statement from him. But Mr. Price isn't through. He also has a chapter on the psychology of music, which I thought was very interesting. Uh, he made several observations in this chapter about modern Christian music. One of the things he said was this. The composers of the, these modern Christian musical pieces, he says the composers emphasize feeling rather than logic and often desire that the words be subordinate to the music. In other words, with regard to Christian hymnody, the music must not be allowed to divert the mind from the text through its emotional appeal. The words must have ascendance over the melody in singing so that reason will prevail. He also quotes Augustine, who said this. Augustine said, When it so happens that I am moved more by the singing than by what is sung, I confess that I have sinned in such wise as to deserve punishment. And at such times I should prefer not to listen to a singer. Price quotes from James Ramsey, uh, who lamented the use of instruments of music in his day. Uh, Ramsey describes much of what we see in modern evangelical churches around us, that music is used to draw the crowds in and to give them an emotional high, basically. Vast numbers of unconverted people come into worship services in churches, and they enjoy the emotional experience created by the music, and, and while they remain unconverted to Jesus Christ, they, they are led to believe that because they took pleasure in the service, because they enjoyed the music, that they have, they have worshipped properly. At the same time, many true Christians are being deceived into thinking that this emotionally charged atmosphere is the presence of the Holy Spirit in some way. There are not a few professing Christians who have said words to me to, to this effect. When, when the music begins, we can feel the Holy Spirit come down. And those kinds of descriptions are testimony to the, to the power that the music can have over our emotions. And yet another chapter, which talked about the simplicity of worship, uh, Price said this. He said, The unconverted man and much of the modern professing church will enter a gospel worship service containing nothing more than the simple ordinances of the New Testament, and declare it all dull and uninteresting. They will have contempt upon its simplicity and plainness. But they disdain such services only because they cannot discern the glorious spiritual realities that are taking place by faith. We must not be troubled or perplexed by this. We must not be ashamed of the simplicity of our worship because carnal men cannot see its glory. Men will never find the simplicity of gospel worship attractive apart from the power of the Holy Spirit in their hearts. Men of unspiritual minds cannot delight in spiritual worship. It is when men fail to see the inward and spiritual glory of gospel worship that they forsake its simplicity and try to add outward devices to make it more attractive to the senses. This is what has happened throughout the history of the church and again in much of the modern church through the use of music. When the power of the Holy Spirit is no longer present in the simple ordinances of the gospel, men become discontent and substitute things that can be seen and touched and heard. And let me remind you one more time that the man who is saying all of these things is a Baptist minister who took it upon himself to do a study of just what does the Bible say about the use of instruments in music. 
Mr. Price's book and his conclusions stand in somewhat stark contrast to the direction that the religious world takes with this issue and even the direction in which some of our brethren take. Some members of the Church of Christ have now concluded that instrumental music is not sinful and, and should not be a point of division among churches. And I could name you some specific churches in the Texas area that have, that have done this. But, but, but here's the difference, and this is kind of a significant difference, I think. The churches that, I, that I've known of that have taken a different approach to this issue, the reason that they have is this. What, what, they, what they have said is, this is what they have said. We looked around, which is always a bad thing. We looked around, and we observed that we had crowds at our services that were much smaller than crowds that were attending denominational churches around us. And that led us to the feeling that we might be doing something wrong. And so we took it upon ourselves to make a study of the issue of instruments of music and worship. And we took three years to study this issue. At the end of the three years, we concluded that it was all right to, to use instruments. Now, I don't have passages that I can give you that support this view because they didn't supply any. But they said, we discovered that it was okay from our thorough study of the Scripture. And, and the, the reason that they maintain that they know they were right about this is because they're now having larger crowds at services. That's kind of the proof that they give. We now have larger crowds at services. Well, that's a little bit different than the motivation and the approach that Mr. Price took in studying this issue. Here's a man who's a Baptist minister who perhaps came from a congregation where instruments were being used. If there was a person who was predisposed to find a scripture that would suggest that instruments could be used in, in worship, you would think this is a man who would have that predisposition. If there were men who you would think would have a predisposition not to find a, a verse of scripture, you would think it would be the elders of these churches in Texas and yet somehow or other, this, this, didn't, this didn't play out the way we might have thought that it would. What does the New Testament say about the uses of instruments of music in worship? What does the New Testament say? Absolutely nothing. There are no passages that address the use of instruments of music in the New Testament. In fact, there are two passages that address the use of music in worship in the New Testament. Music, not instruments of music, but music. One is Ephesians 5. Ephesians 5, verses 18 and 19. And do not get drunk with wine, for that is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody with your heart to the Lord. The other passage is Colossians 3 and verse 16. Let the word of Christ richly dwell within you with all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with thankfulness in your hearts to God. That is the complete extent of how the New Testament addresses music in worship. Nowhere does the New Testament authorize the use of instruments of music in the worship of God. So those who choose to use them, they have either seen something that I haven't, and that's possible, I suppose. I, I, won't, I won't say that's impossible. Or they're just doing this because they have some other kind of motivation which would lead them to think this is a good idea. Well, I want to make three applications from this, if I could, very, very briefly. Three applications of what we've just considered here. The first has to do with the idea of the use of instruments in music. I know that this is a topic with which we are somewhat familiar. Most of us are anyway. And therefore, it might be something we may wonder why, why preach on this subject? What I'm going to suggest about that is, is that the use of instruments in music is, well, it's kind of like what I said at the very beginning. This is one of those things that makes us somewhat different from the religious world. It is one of those big things that people observe and notice. And therefore, my feeling is it's not a bad thing to be reminded of this from time to time, just exactly why we practice in worship the way we practice with the use of music. I think that's kind of important. The second thing I'd, I'd, I'd mention in terms of application is what I think we see really is the endorsement by Mr. Price of the biblical hermeneutic that we use. Uh, 
This is a man who took a subject that he wanted to know, what does the Bible teach about this? What does the Bible teach about this? And he took an approach where he seemingly set aside, completely set aside any kind of predisposition, any kind of thing that he thought that he knew, and just read what the Bible said and drew conclusions based on what the Bible said. Now, I don't know what he did with those conclusions. I don't know how this affected him and where he was preaching or where he's preaching. I have no idea what happened in terms of this. But the approach was very interesting because it is the same approach that we teach, that we should take with the Scriptures. And when he took this approach, he came to the conclusion that what we do in our worship is biblical. It is the correct thing. And I think that's encouraging. I think that is reassuring. And I, and I, I think that's an important thing to get from this. The third thing, and maybe this is the most important thing, is, is that the approach that each one of us takes when we read our Bibles? When we read and study our Bibles, do we do it the way that Mr. Price did it with this subject? Do we look just at what the Bible is saying to us? Or do we approach our Bible study with the, the thought that we know some things and we're just kind of looking for affirmation that we have it right? That's really not the best way to study the Bible. The best way to study the Bible is to just let the Bible talk to us. Just let it do all the talking. We do all the receiving and we try to process that which we're told. God is speaking to us in this word. It's not some kind of a catechism where we just, now we sort of have all the right answers. And when we read scriptures, we're just making sure. We're looking to see those right answers pop up from time to time. We should study our Bibles with this mindset that we let it speak to us. We don't believe anything because somebody else believes it. We believe it because this is what God said. We don't turn away from anything because other people think it's a bad idea. We turn away from it because God says turn away from it. We just use what the Bible says, the same approach that Mr. Price used in writing his book. I've had conversations with folks, and I'm sure that you have too, who when I talk to them about the Scriptures, and, and they don't maybe know a lot about the Scriptures, and I try to talk to them about Jesus Christ, who died for our sins, who, who makes it possible for us to have the forgiveness of sins. And when I speak with people that way, and I'm sure that you're the same way, we do try to take this approach. Well, let's just look and see what the Bible says. Here's what God has done for us. Now, what does he expect from us? And we get lots of different answers about that in the religious world. But what does God say? What God says is that we have to believe in his son. We have to believe in him. We have to believe that He's the Son of God. We have to recognize that He died for us. We also must repent of our sins. God has nowhere told us that it's, it's okay for us to believe in Him and then live like the devil as much as we want in this world. He expects us to live a certain way, and He gives us so much instruction about the right way to live in this Word. And he also says to us that if we want to receive the forgiveness of our sins, if we want that sacrifice of Jesus to be effectual in our life, what we must do is to be baptized in order to have our sins washed away. That's what the Apostle Peter told some men in Acts chapter 2 who asked, what shall we do? Repent and be baptized, each one of you, every one of you, for the remission of your sins. And you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. That's the plan of salvation. Believe in the Lord. Repent of sins. Be baptized to receive forgiveness of sins and then live a life as, to the best of our ability, as faithful as we can to what God teaches us, to be what He wants us to be, to go where He wants us to go, to teach what He wants us to teach, to be a light in this world of people who don't know the Lord Jesus. Perhaps there is someone here this morning who would like to obey the gospel of Jesus Christ. This is the thing that I've heard people say to me from time to time. Well, I, I understand what the Bible says there. I see what it says. You're right, it says that, but I just don't know if I need to do all that. I'll, God will just have to take me the way I am or he'll just have to not take me. I can't imagine. I couldn't tell you how many people have said that to me. Well, he doesn't. 
He doesn't have to take you the way you are. He doesn't have to take any of us the way we are. He expects us to be transformed by His Word. Anyone who goes too far and does not abide in the teaching of Christ does not have God. One who abides in the teaching has both the Father and the Son. And, and there are warnings in Scripture. There are many warnings. Here's one. 2 Thessalonians 1, verses 6 through 8. It's only just for God to repay with affliction those who afflict you and to give relief to you who are afflicted and to us as well when the Lord Jesus will be revealed from heaven with His mighty angels in flaming fire dealing out retribution to those who do not know God and to those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. I pray that no one in this room will face that kind of tribulation, that kind of terrible faith at the judgment. But if there's someone here this morning who needs to obey that gospel, if you believe in the Lord Jesus, you're willing to change your life, you want to be baptized to have your sins washed away, you're determined to live for God from this point forward, then we stand ready to help you. And please give us that chance while together we stand and while we sing.